Welcome back everyone to SuperCloud 7. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE here in the Palo Alto studio. It's got a great lineup. Vinod Chandar is here, the CEO of OneHouse, a very hot startup founded in 2021. We've been following this company since the, the early days of funding. Greylock was an initial investor, three rounds of funding. Um, keeping it humble, lean and mean, but an aggressive uh, vision. Thanks for coming in. All right, thanks for having me. Uh, so great fan of the show. Part of the SuperCloud 7 is to really kind of zoom out at the industry and look at obviously the pressure that generative AI is putting on everybody, which is great because it, it educates everyone that data is everything. And so what you're seeing is a freak out on, in the data storage area, data storage, a data warehouse, even the data cloud guys like Snowflake and Databricks. Mm. I won't say they're shaking in their boots, but clearly the script is flipping. You guys have this universal lake house direction, which is, promising to unify kind of multiple environment, data traversal, data management. It's not easy, right? So I want to get into that and I want to understand how you see the world because recently Snowflake Summit and Databricks, Data Plus AI, a lot of discussion, a lot of hyperbole, a lot of announcements. Some, some you got to read the fine print, some's not shipping, some's GA. Yeah. There's a lot of what does it do with this or that, there's multiple formats, a lot going on. Um, so let's get into it. Explain the reason why One House was started and where you guys are now, given that the landscape is under mm. uh, high velocity. It's right. The pace of play is high, but yet there's no yet standards fully formed. Yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start off with, with our story and why we, we exist, right? So if you look at it, our origin goes back to building the world's first data lake house right? back in the day at Uber. It wasn't, the, the term wasn't coined, we called it a transactional data lake, but we built this project and we grew like Apache Hoodie, uh, you know, in the community, we took it through the Apache mm -hmm. incubation. Mm -hmm. The thing that we learned over those next four years was, well, the technology is there. We b firmly believe an open lake house is the, the way of the future, but there aren't good, like easy to, like there is no snowflake experience for the lake house per se, yeah. right? You need to go hire people, you need to build the lake mm -hmm. house yourself. And we see a lot of different companies kind of spend like many months and platform teams on that effort. So one of us founded to kind of with this premise that we are going to bet on this open lake house being the, mm -hmm. the, the one house that is going to store the data for diverse use cases. Mm -hmm. And the bet that, oh, well, uh, we're going to be in a world where there's multiple workloads and we feel like today it's kind of like converged mm -hmm. to that point. Uh, and and uh, it was certainly not the case in 2021. When we founded the company, we talked to many people, there was still this kind of a uh, little bit of this, um, you know, uh, I would say like uh, data lakes were a little ambiguous. People yeah. quite didn't get ROI out of it. But quickly in the last three years, you've seen this kind of convergence of the warehouse and the lakes into kind of like yeah. this, whether you call it table format or lake house or whatever term, I think the industry is moving in that direction. It's interesting, you know, if you go back when theCUBE just started 14 years ago or so, I can't believe it's been that long, Hadoop was the big deal, right? So, you know, then Spark came along, but I think the lake houses became kind of the default of, okay, I have some sprawl, it's hard to manage and do that. So now, but now it's been really the central thing because with generative AI, one of the things that's coming out in the application layer is, is that if you have unified data, it's better. it's better. Siloed approaches, unified doesn't mean centralized, it, it means unified. So again, we're going to get into that distinction. So I want to get into that because, I and also want to give context to the viewers because you were at Uber. You mentioned you built the lake, uh, lake house architecture first, but that was not one house. That was when you were at Uber, which by the way, Uber built a killer system for managing people, places, and things that have been on the queue multiple times. So we've documented a lot of history. I mean, it was a pioneering engineering effort because that use case was unique. Now we're seeing the Uber-like experience yeah. coming to the enterprise. So in a way you are the, uh, the pioneer of this notion of, and you were forced to do it you, because you had pressure to scale. You had yeah. scale, you had functionality and cars are third party, you got payments. I mean, there's a lot going on. You're streaming a lot of data. Yeah. Explain that how that, how that all came together. I think the Uber story yeah. is a nice segue into why one house exists and then why the standard for this layer of interoperability is important. Yeah, that's a great question, right? So, so when we uh, when I joined Uber 2014, right, uh, and it was like it was the third person on the rear team, and we had like a warehouse and like uh, some S3 files. That's kind of like where typically <laughs> where everybody was. It's and raw, I had, bare metal cloud. And I had just come from LinkedIn, which was like a, like at that point like a very mature org. We had built Kafka, like several key value stores and whatnot. So we did the like you know the first time we d we did 
you know, we, we made the stack very scalable. First few years we focused on like a streaming data architecture where we could operate Uber across like seven, eight data centers, data flowing across, and you know, we put a lot of work into getting the data architecture right, but then we hit a wall. Essentially, Uber had a lot of transactional data. For example, trips, for example, trips changes. You're on an Uber ride for 20 minutes, so things happen as you do the ride, or you sometimes rate the ride after you took the ride, the next time you open the app. There are lots of use cases for mutability, so data's changing, and we couldn't figure out how a scalable way to capture that downstream. And Uber is a very real-time business, right? Yeah. Like quite literally, you know, the weather changes, the business is going to change because surge is going to kick in, or something's going to happen, exactly. right? So we needed change to- Change your trip, add a driver, you know, exactly. change it. And, and we had only two options. We run every pipeline in a streaming mode, which costs like a lot of money. We cannot just, you know, it's not even feasible to do that. Or we kind of, you know, make our data processing on the lake more smart and intelligent. So we, what we said was, we looked at warehouses, databases, and we said, if we brought some of that functionality, just on top of HDFS and, uh, you know, like a YAN, like compute layer, today in the cloud, that is S3 and Kubernetes, but scalable compute, scalable storage. What we missed was this database-like abstraction on top of it, so that's how we conceived yeah. the project. And, uh, you know, like, uh, off the bat, we had to run it for, you know, the, 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 the notion of one house came in, like, you know, what we build, what trying to build in the industry here, we kind of built it, like, day, the first release, because first cut of- At Uber, you mean? At Uber. Yeah. First cut of hoodie had to support Spark, Hive, and uh, Presto <laughs> for interactive querying, uh, data science, yeah. and uh, ETLs, right? So you, so right from the get-go, they're like, three different engines for three different workloads, and that's how the, this whole layer was born. And again, we, we believe this is the right model, yeah. and it's taken the industry some time, I would say, to get this point, but I think right we are now living in this world, so and the uh, AI... Uh, all enterprises are going real time, and again, they, they hold on to that old siloed data warehouse because that's what they're used to. Yeah. But now, this you're either out of business or you don't have a generative AI piece, so you have multiple engines. Exactly. It's a reality, it's not like a one-off Uber thing. Exactly, exactly, this is like mainstream. At that point, when we were building it, and even when we open sourced the project, it was for like a couple of years, it was this like nerdy thing that the Uber engineers yeah, yeah. built. Yeah. But then when GDPR happened, it showed the world that you can't just like shove files into S3 and forget about it anymore. Yeah. You need to actually manage them and index yeah. them and not not. The AI, like movement, we we certainly see a lot of companies who, for example, just picked like a you know like an in integration tool on a cloud warehouse. Yeah. Now realizing that they need to build a different data architecture for AI, which is more aligned with the yeah. I want to get into that because I think that's the key driver here. You know, I was um, I was asked to ask you why is the lake house or architecture a winning approach or architecture? Uh, in, we kind of know that there's now pressure, business pressure from the board to the developers as well, to get that Gen AI thing up and running, Gen AI environment, and that we know it's a new category. So it's really forcing the tech community, the platform engineers and developers are saying, hey, no excuses, no fashion wars around this, that, the other thing. This is the environment, you got diversity of database, you got diversity of capabilities, get it to work. Stop screwing around, right? This is kind of a mandate. I'm, I'm, over, I'm a little bit over the top in, in, yeah, in, in yeah. the emphasis, but that's kind of the vibe right now. And so there's no excuse because you got to get the foundation set up with the platform. That's what the lake house is seeing to do. Now under the covers, yes, Silicon's getting better. Read writes change on storage architecture. I get that networking is obviously going to evolve, mm -hmm. but the next layer up is a complete reset. Is that how you see it? Yeah, I exactly right. And, and, and this is like pretty evident from all the blogs from let's say uh, OpenAI or Google, or which talk about open source mm -hmm. part of the 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 you know the AI uh, story as well, mm -hmm. so that's moving pretty fast, right? And and you have a lot of tools. You have like yeah. so many vector databases, so many frameworks today, mm -hmm. and the and the the field is so yearly, right? So the only right th approach here is to have like an open data layer, and so that you know you can be kind of a little bit of an insurance policy, if you will. So as the ecosystem matures, you have a single copy of the data across all these different use cases. And that is the, the, the main driving factor that we see. Um, as uh, like Notion, uh, if you're familiar with yeah, the company, it's a, it's a great uh, note-taking yeah. app, very beloved product. So their engineering team wrote a, like a cool blog about how they were using a Snowflake-based like cloud data warehouse. And now for the Notion AI product, they actually built a lake house model mm -hmm. to store uh, vector embeddings, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and then kind of it helps them kind of 
still serve the BI workloads using Snowflake and yeah. warehouses while bringing on like Spark or multiple other frameworks on top of the data mm -hmm. to, to, to manage like uh, the, the, the... Well, it's just about the notion use case, and I think this is kind of where I see the broader trend is you're taking unstructured data and making that essentially an input or prompt into data, other data, and then obviously the generative AI. Right. Say, here's my notion, okay, do okay. something with it. So they're using that to generate value. So it's like, exactly. a, they already have a built-in data set in the yeah. user product. Yeah. And, and a, a good chunk of this actually is a, a, a data pipeline or a data integration kind of mm -hmm. like management problem as well. Essentially, you have a lot of data sitting in your production databases, like there's a, like a blob column there or a, you know, yeah. like I'm a, like an older, like I started my career at Oracle, so I think yeah. still in that <laughs> terms. So there's like, you know, yeah, blobs, a lot of raw data. Blobs, raw data. Yeah. You want to ingest them in, yeah. do that in a reliable way, and yeah. have the flexibility to be able to kind of like train them or build embed, generate embeddings off of them. Yeah. That is where I see a lot of the, you know, uh, the repetitive work, and that's yeah. where I think the data lakehouse infrastructure needs to kind of like, be like a lot more easier to do. It's interesting, I saw, um, obviously you're funded by Greylock, Jerry Chen's been on theCUBE many times, he's a distinguished CUBE alumni. He also invested in another company called uh, uh, Rockset, which got acquired by OpenAI. So people are saying, you might not even have to build SQL and schema anymore, that the Gen AI will do it for you. So unstructured is certainly the big tsunami now, but SQL data, structured data is still very valuable in, yeah. in the schema thing, so you need to have that too. So it's not just unstructured, it's the balance between structured data and unstructured data because it's already a source of truth. Yeah, it's a great observation. If you look at the Lakehouse uh, kind of the, the story so far, it's actually been about structured data. So what we've done is actually borrow like our adapt warehouse mm -hmm. capabilities, which have been more stayed on structured data to the lake, which was, but but I think the coming years, I think you'll see yeah. that the Lakehouse technologies focus a lot more on unstructured data in a way that you can store both side by side, you have a single data management framework covering all of this, mm -hmm. right? So we, we, are, we are, for example, we are working on bringing vector searches to the lake house, mm -hmm. right? And and, and uh, the, the community's already started, uh, like companies like Nielsen IQ have published like benchmarks around, you know, managing vectors for serving on a specialized store versus yeah. can you do it on the lake house with some cost performance gains? So that is, kind of kick starting, yeah, yeah. so so I think you'll see a move in that direction. Just for the folks that aren't technical that are watching, um, vector database and vector embeds is essentially neural network format, which is what people are going to be moving to. Yeah. And then from there you get graphs, you get knowledge graphs and, and whatnot come into that. That's going to be a huge trend, and, and right. you would agree with that's an important part of the future. Exactly, so this is like a very key part of like building your RAG applications, if you will, right? You need to, mm -hmm. going back to Rockset story, I think uh, a good chunk as I understood it from the press was like lot, lot so Rockset ultimately build like an index system that can index data and serve like these searches. So when you are building a LLM based like A application, you need to retry things that are relevant to your query, yeah. right? So that's, the, that's a very critical part of your RAG application. We'll have to get Vencat to make sure Silicon Angle is properly crawled by OpenAI now that he's over there. We got some contacts over there. Um, I'm happy for those guys. Let's get into the, to the, the real trend here that's going to make or break, uh, what, in my opinion, really open, break the dam down for Gen AI, and that's the open data layer model, this open data formats. Mm -hmm. That's a huge thing that has to happen, in our, in our opinion. Um, and no one company yet has it. You guys have an opportunity to do that. Does the table format matter? You mentioned at Uber yeah. you had multiple engines, so yeah. you're, you come from that origination of, hey, we've dealt with multiple engines. Got it. Um, because that's what everyone pretty much has right now, is pre-existing. Yeah. So they either rip and replace, or just pre-exist and integrate multiple engines. Do you see keeping the multiple engines? Are people just going to one? What's How do you see the customers thinking through the, or architect, from architects thinking about this? Yeah, so I think on when it comes to table formats, it's 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 really like a little bit of a misnomer. It's actually table metadata format. The tables, date, we, what we are implying is it's like a parquet, or like our ORC, mostly parquet, I guess, based data format that everybody can read and write, right? And then there's a little bit of metadata out there which basically says, here is a table. Here is how you can understand this vast collection of parquet, arrow files, or like open data format files as a table, as a snapshot and whatnot. So I think the the how you represent that table itself doesn't matter as much, right? So we've done a quite a bit of work uh, in the space using uh, 
uh, one table, the Apache, which is now the Apache X table project. B before we created that, the market narrative was, oh, you needed to, this is like Parquet versus ORC. You need to pick mm -hmm. one and that controls everything. So you're saying it's metadata, but what, so it's open data formats is what, so format is the metadata, right? Format is Not the, the engine. Engines are different things. Engines are different things. Okay, so, so what's there's an engine and a format in your mind? Yeah, so that's a great question. So if you look at how, uh, let's say, cloud warehouses are typically built, there's usually a col proprietary columnar format, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Snowflake has its own format, BigQuery has its own format, and then there is a SQL layer sitting on top, and there's like a data management layer sitting on top, a governance catalog sitting on top. So these three, the last three is SQL, the governance, and the, the data management layer, are deeply coupled with that like data layer. Mm -hmm. What it creates is it creates like, it's not easy for you to move this data to another engine without. Uh, Through you know, the governance stuff and all the other stuff. Exactly. The dependencies of the other layers are tied to the data. Tied to the data. Yeah. So what's broadly going on now is this four layers are getting unbundled mm -hmm. in, a, in a way that, okay, now we are saying, okay, instead of a proprietary yeah. columnar format, store data and parquet, use one of these table formats to represent them as tables and the SQL layer of these warehouses are proprietary engines, and governance layers can recognize yeah. these tables, right? So that's, I think, where we moved from 2021 to 2024 now, I think. Mm -hmm. And all the recent news you see around yeah. the governance catalogs is essentially the next layer in the in the stack that is now getting a little bit yeah. unpacked. But no, it's great to have you on theCUBE because there's a lot of things going on. I think the biggest things that if you zoom up and go the high, high bit here, you got lake houses separate compute from data. Right. And now you have open formats. Those two things really become the core yeah. elements of what we're talking about here, right? Got it, got it. Okay, yes. so, so, okay, and that, and so that, that's cool. Love the compute separate from data. That's done, it's happening, good. Now the formats, everyone says, that mm -hmm. they can support open formats, mm -hmm. read and writes, et cetera. But if you read the fine print, Snowflake can only read but can't write Delta, but they, if you, they write it, they can read it. This is, what is the, what yeah. will set what's going on? Who does what and what actually does read writes across okay. multiple engines? Okay, okay. So this is like a very, very, uh, you know, like a detailed kind of conversation <laughs> as you can put it. So I'll, I'll start simple. So the, the, the basic fundamental need for everybody is the data stored in open format and everybody can read it. The world today, people pick a writer, right? So your writer can be an open source framework like Spark or Flink. Uh, your writer can be like a, like a you know, warehouse like mm -hmm. Snowflake, right? So the world right now is basically saying, uh, you know, pick the writer and uh, the management, you make a choice on that, and then everybody should be able to read, correct? So the, um, for for example. If it's open. Yeah, or, yeah, so, I mean, so data you can write in open formats, as long as the compute, for let's take a Snowflake example, just yeah. to make it like super clear, yeah. right? So you can use uh, Spark or Flink, write some like hoodie table even, mm -hmm. for example, or Delta Lake table, use a project like Xtable to translate this mm -hmm. little piece of metadata, and you can read that, query that data from Snowflake SQL in place without converting anything. No degradation performance. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's now gotten much better. There's probably, we, at least from our benchmark, we used to see 5x degradation two years ago. It went, uh, it, it went to 40%, and now it's like 10%, so it's just kind of like okay, right? Uh, but if you want to create read-write open data format tables, then you need to use Snowflake's catalog and Snowflake as the writer, and they produce only iceberg tables mm -hmm. as writers, yeah. right? So now, if you want to read that within Databricks, again, you use a, 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 like a project like Xtable to mm -hmm. format, like met, just convert the metadata, the parquet files stay the same, mm -hmm. and then you can now access this in Databricks, you can use all the cool- uh, They can features. read it. They can read it. But not write. Not write. Because they're not on the Snowflake. Yeah, layer. right. Just different vendors, yeah. So, what needs to happen for everybody to read and write harmoniously? Yes, that's the goal. The thing that we need to solve is people need to agree on what catalogs to use. For example, Databricks and Snowflake, for example, in this model, mm -hmm. have to agree to like using a like a catalog or some kind of central coordination service, yeah. which can basically coordinate between these two writers. Because reads are easy. So as you can see, this is a very tough thing for vendors to align on, yeah. and that's kind of like what's going on. And there's on. business logic and business strategy behind it, also lock in yeah. portability, moving yeah. data in and yeah. out. 
yeah, I mean, there's definitely like locking concerns, and 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 for us, like we are we are big on like you know having a yeah. like a no locking kind of architecture. But uh, I think also from a technical standpoint, yeah. these catalogs are things that are deeply integrated with like your query engines as well. So it's not very easy for people yeah. to kind of pull them out. Yeah. Our model here, we recently released something called a multi-catalog sync. We actually embrace the world that there are multiple catalogs, and we are working towards this vision of, okay, uh, single copy of data, mm -hmm. this table shows up in Snowflake as a table that you can read, right? And then it, it shows up in Databricks as a uh, you know, table that you can write. If the vendors and the engines come together and create that common catalog, great, mm -hmm. right? But until then, the biggest other lock-in point that we see is this permissioning system. Yeah. So you are a big the enterprise. Governance piece. Governance piece. Yeah, huge you, problem. You are an enterprise, and you have, let's say, 100,000 tables, or maybe 10,000, thousands of tables. And then you set permissions in your organization mm -hmm. in a certain way for this, right? So this is one of the times that you realize that open formats alone are insufficient, because how would you bring a new engine to this mix? Somebody needs to translate these permissions in an equivalent way into this new engine that you're trying to do, Right, so that is the, the 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 when we talk to a lot of users. So you guys see a future where decoupling the permit governance yes has to be there, and it, allow the multiple engines wherever they are and w what new engines come in yeah and how formats evolve yeah that's case sense or use case sensitive or situational. Yeah, it, it is. That's the ideal world. Yeah. But uh, from from uh, I've been waking up to work in open source for 15 <laughs> years now. The only thing I learned is that. I think uh, it takes time, right? A lot of time, the, and and most of these changes have happened because the users want it. So I think we should start with a system that mm -hmm. where you can, in an open format, describe your permissioning, and a, syst a system in open source can translate it to Snowflake catalog, BigQuery's catalog, all the all the different catalogs out there. Then at least you have the the like a realistic. Are you doing that to today? Uh, we are doing part of it today, mm -hmm. and uh, our roadmap is going to extend into dealing with permissions as yep. well in this way, because we, we see this as the number one thing yeah. for customers Absolutely. to be able to explore multiple engines. Yeah. Uh, we have customers in, let's say, AWS customers who want to use the three AWS engines or Snowflake or Databricks. We want them to have the option to pick them. The open format, this, this is a sol little bit of a solved problem, that yeah. layer but the permissioning becomes the actual yeah. problem yeah. for them to try yeah, anything. It's a tough nut to crack. I mean, Amazon doesn't have a one lake house approach because they have so many different things going on. They can't, they can't yeah. make that happen. Yeah, I mean, Amazon has like these products called like you know, Lake Formation, which yeah. does some permissioning. But for example, Lake Formation doesn't talk to Unity Catalog or Lake Formation doesn't talk to the Snowflake Catalog. So if you set some permissions okay. within that, it, it just works within the AWS ecosystem. So you can't bring, easily yeah. bring a new engine into the yeah. mix. I mean, heterogeneous <laughs> environments will be the norm. That's why I think you're on the right track here. Now let's get out of the weeds for yeah. a second, which I appreciate that, because yeah. there's a lot of nuance involved in this open data, and it's a huge discussion. Yeah. Because how things fall will determine if we ever get to what we need to get to in this kind of interoperable layer, yes. uh, which is really the holy grail everyone wants to see happen. Mm. Kind of reminds me of the old Kubernetes days, pre-Kubernetes, like, okay, finally it happened. Um, if you look at the businesses today, you're looking at IT guys, database yeah. guys, people from analytics. And so a lot of the tech nerds that were really doing all the infrastructure have been down at the infrastructure level. Yeah. Okay, you were at Uber, you built this out because you had to. Yeah. You had multiple engines. You're now you're seeing a shift towards platform engineering turning into essentially data engineering, but it's not analytics people. It's not DBAs or the old school data folks, although they'll still have a role, this apps, app layer there, they're more on the app mm -hmm. side. There's an engineering trend now for this specific engineering task. Yeah. What are customers doing right now? Because they're starting to lay out new architecture. What do they do, how they use you guys, and what's some of the things that you see them doing to be successful? Yeah. Do you agree with that trend? I mean, I'm sure you do, right? Yeah, yeah, I do. And, and definitely, I think there's a, there's a need. Uh, if you look at, for example, even the warehouse user, like learn from yeah. that whole modern data stack uh, movement, if you will, yeah. right? So there is a lot of that going on, right? Where initially, it was the, this easy to use. Yeah. Uh, you can have backend engineers and other people just like set up the data pipelines and unblock the rest of the company. There, there isn't that like ease of use yeah. of experience on the, the lake house stack yet. Right. There's no um, SRE yet role. Like yeah, kind of yeah. big time. Lake House SRE <laughs> kind of role hasn't. Yeah, I mean, hasn't it's, a lot of, it's a complex system. You're talking about, this is not just a database problem. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a deep data optimization problem, right? So, so I think what people are able to do, uh, most companies, they're, they're able to hire like data engineers or even uh, we see people who are like platform engineers getting trained into writing really good SQL or really good like data pipelines, right? But the thing that we typically see them struggle with is, uh, especially when they come from like a managed warehouse land into like a mm -hmm. lake house, is they suddenly realize, oh, I need to like do a lot of file management. I need to do, actually like you need to be in the weeds actually yeah. managing and optimizing tables. So that is where I think I mean, like, You get to uh, the almost like, it's, I won't say assemblers, it's not assembler, but root level, yeah. close to the to the source, whether it's kernel or whatever, yeah. into the software layer. That's where the, uh, that performance is, right? That's they got to they get to that. Yeah, I think I think pe most people work at like at least a couple layers above that. Uh, but still, I feel th these are still like very uh, deep problems, yeah. right? What does the how do you balance like a file size on S3 to so that you get like the right read and the right performance. This is like very yeah. like deep problems. So this is where I think uh, we built like quite a ton of value in the open source project itself in Hoodie, yeah. like it man self manages yeah. itself. Um, but we are also building a lot more uh, kind of like platformization. That's where we focus on, okay, we have an open interoperable data layer, but we want to centrally manage it so that you get the, even if you want to run a benchmark against two query engines today, like the performance can swing wildly Based on how well you manage the data, yeah. right? So, right? So, so I think I think these are the kind of challenges that people are. All right. So you guys built your business from the Hootie open source, which you donated from Uber. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's great. And then built one house on top of that. Are you guys still doubling down on Hootie? You mentioned platform engineering. How is your business structured today? What is the value proposition that you guys are offering? Yeah. So our our model is pretty simple. Uh, it's it's kind of like at least I guess like goes back to how like I've done engineering uh, all, all my career, use the best tool for the best job. So we use Hoodie as our storage layer and our management layer because it gives us like a lot of rich functionality, which many, many data lakes are already running. And also it gives us the best incremental write read performance out of any system out there, right? But we've also, since the company- For large data sets too, like this is like not just for- Large or small, even yeah. medium scale. So streaming data, whatever you got yeah. coming in. Streaming data, like if you see a lot of like database CDC kind of workloads, wherever there are updates and change involved, goes all the way back to our origin yeah. story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have like, uh, you know, uh, kind of like unmatched performance, cost advantages, features, functionality around that. Uh, but we recognize the, the and, and we want we don't want to build a silo around even like hoodie in, yeah. in some sense. So that's why we started this effort called One Table late uh, last year. We open sourced that. Since then, we uh, you know so we announced it as a paid feature in our product. We are asking for people open source contributions to it, and we partnered with Google and Microsoft last year to open source that project. Now it's gone even a lot more low. It's incubating in the Apache Software Foundation as Apache X Table. So we are essentially building. So that became X Table. That became X Table. Okay, that's what I was going to make sure everyone get that. Yeah. And X Table is where the action is for the rights for converting, yeah. is that what? So the, the thing that Xtable does, for example, I'll, uh, for in, in our product, what it does is you write data as like in the hoodie format, you get the, all the advantages uh, on the writer side, but you still get the read interoperability with Databricks and Snowflake, for example, right? right? Uh, to take a different example, recently in Build, Microsoft announced this partnership with Snowflake. Mm -hmm. So one of the uh, things that is like, Xtable plays a key role in translating between Snowflake iceberg writes into Delta Lake reads on Fabric, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So, so Xtable basically kicks in after a write yep. and exposes the same data in all three uh, table formats, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, kind of we we kind of solved that like lock in at that point. Yeah. To a lot to of translation, a lot of management on, under the covers happening. It's it's actually pretty simple. It's essentially a post processor because the metadata is pretty small. Mm -hmm. You can you do a write and then you translate the metadata. And, yeah. and you're done. The key is governance. Let's get back to who manages yeah. all this. So I love the vision, and I think the idea that any managed, any engine can come in, write, read, yeah. at scale. Who manages all this? How do you control this? Take us through the, the, the yeah. steady state of an enterprise architect laying this out so they can bring in and scale, not worry about it later. What is the ideal governance layer? Yeah, let's take, a, let's take this scenario, and we, we see this a lot in our customer base as well. So you have an enterprise architect who wants to basically uh, build an open data lake house, he, and he wants to use, let's say, Snowflake and Databricks, Databricks for data science, you know, Snowflake for BI, right? Mm -hmm. So what they typically end up doing is they, they, if they use one house, we can move the data pretty fast, we do ELT, and then with Xtable, we expose that single copy of data 
into we, we, we let the multi catalog feature that I talked about, we register tables into Snowflake into the into Databricks as well, right? Mm -hmm. But the governance piece right now, they go to Snowflake and grant permissions and like, you know, the permissioning, whatever they need to do in Snowflake, they do it like out of band on that engine mm -hmm. and similar for the other engine, right? So this is one piece where we, this is still like super tied to the actual query engine because we can, for example, say, set a row level uh, security policy on a table, but the engine has to enforce it, right? So, yeah. so the engine needs to cooperate, f like uh, you know, with the catalog. So, what the approach that we are taking is, uh, we are trying to basically figure out a way to define the permissioning structure for different catalogs in an open way on on one house, and then have these permissions be translated. So, it's like a easy way because most users find it daunting to translate these yeah. permissions across That's catalogs. It's a nightmare. Right, and then we, while on Xtable, we are kind of like doing a lot of efforts to bring more around interoperability and unify, but as those are more like, you know, yeah. that's a long-term effort. Uh, I think I think we'll see some fruits after a few years, but in the meantime, this is a super practical approach, we believe, mm -hmm. that uh, solves the pain points of the users today. Mm -hmm. uh, because you're gonna be running workloads from here to the next two, three years before that yeah. can happen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then we need a solution. Yeah, and we tell all of the folks who watch the queue, they all know how we, we weigh in our opinion, to read the fine print on the read writes, because there's, there's nuances. If it's Delta Lake, he's, they can read, that iceberg, but can't write iceberg. It's all kinds of, it's very Byzantine in terms of like, if you drew a flow chart, it'd be like brutal. But we're getting to the goal here. So I want to get the final recommendation from you. For mm. folks watching, they really want to set the table for the future, okay? Right, right. Um, and so what do you recommend that they do now? I got Databricks, I got Snowflake. On our research and the surveys we take, take from customers, there's a lot of overlap between Databricks yeah. and Snowflake. So clearly they're coexisting. Yeah, exactly. And, and so there's not a lot of this and that. Well, they do compete um, and there's lock-in and they want a lock-in because that's how they stay in business. We see them both succeeding. The rising tide will make everyone successful. So what does someone have to do to make all this work? What's your recommendation? Exactly, so we, this is, uh, so we have a blog that goes into more technical details on this, but I think at the, at the very, what we recommend is at least your first two layers. You, you're, you're, so practically you, may, you have to, you know, do some data science processing deeper using, you know, database functionality, Databricks functionality. Mm -hmm. You may have to use some deeper Snowflake functionality. At that point, you'll have to choose some of the, the even the proprietary yeah. formats that they support, right? So we would say the first two layers, ingest and prepare your data in a very open format mm -hmm. with interoperability across the board. Yeah. That way you are able to switch engines for vast majority of your data if needed, mm -hmm. right? And then pick the right tool for the right job. The the reason why you see that overlap increasing is probably you know coincides with the rise of data science yeah, as well. Of course. More and more companies are doing data science, right? Yeah, and people are investing, they see the future, they're not idiots. They go, okay, we gotta set we gotta get our act together, clean our house and stop the fashion wars, just get set up yeah. and get going. The, the one other subtle thing that pe most people don't realize that I'll tell you, and, and we face this issue at Uber as well, right? So when we built Hoodie, the, the, we, we made it a point to make it fast. The, the reason was, sure, Uber's real time. Th those are all like business-driven reasons, yeah. but very tactically yeah, as yeah. well. Ver like for example, the, the on-prem warehouse that we were using wouldn't scale to the data, but it could actually take updates in a, in a like you know, in within an hour, where like our Hadoop jobs would take like eight, nine hours to complete. Yeah, so like the minute you you are not fast on the ingestion or the data prep layers, somebody will build a silo, right? Yeah. And then and then your data architecture, you lose the the data quality because with this architecture, you can enforce data it's like, quality. It's like in self-inflicted technical debt. Exactly. And, and so many times at Uber, we early days, we couldn't get, for example, the data scientists and the, 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 the people that, like ops folks who are looking at the real numbers, mm -hmm. they were feeding out of the warehouse, they are feeding out of the data lake, they couldn't yeah. un, like agree, right? So, this, so we talk a lot of infrastructure and everything, but look at the amount of time we spend in meetings just aligning on yeah. what the data says. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, just throwing tomatoes at each other. Yeah, it's like yeah. debates, tech people, arm wrestling, pissing contests, all that happens. I got to ask you, because you mentioned earlier the data optimization problem. What are the key problems that are people are solving when people, when they have to hire talent or actually scope the problem, what even identify the problem? Data optimization is one big engineering problem. Yeah. What are some other problems that are that specifically are, are problems that, that categorically you could define? 
Yeah, so there's a lot of like uh, data preparation and pipelines in addition to data optimization, right? So data optimization broadly boils down to, do you understand your data? Is the, is the data laid out, you know, like conducive to your queries? Are you, for example, like, these are just old database techniques like clustering, and yeah. are you applying all those things correctly uh, to reduce your uh, query, right? That's yeah. the bucket of work. The second, uh, on the pipelines, I would say a lot of teams, like it's, it's actually like a lot of work to operate these many pipelines, yeah. right? If you have like 5,000 tables, like hundreds of tables even, yeah. you need a four person engineering team, uh, somebody on an on call yeah. and a page. Engineers love to solve yeah. problems. So yeah. this is what you got, trying to get the problem. Like, hey, you said, give me a big problem to solve, and I'm going to solve it. Yeah, exactly. So data optimization, pipelining, and then balancing the data freshness latency and balancing the costs, right? So this is like yeah. another thing. So you, you want it yeah. to be faster, you can write faster, it costs you more money. So so how do you, like, yeah. the you know, essentially what we see data platform teams invest in yeah. uh, or like the first two. It's hard to find talent. All you got to grow your own or just go to someone who just was happened to be a Python wizard and loves SQL and they just happen to be savant yeah. genius. Exactly. All right, Vinod, it's great to have you on. Final question, yeah. I know we've got to wrap up. What's the coolest thing you've done with One House that you can point to and say, you don't have to name the customer, but it could be like a scope scale that highlights the value that's going to come out of this unification? Yeah, so I think uh, we are, uh, the, with, with, with the multi-catalog sync that we released, right? I think we are, we are the first ever point where you can actually ingest data as fast as possible and go use multiple, get the best performance about completely two different engines. This wasn't like a, uh, this was like a pipe dream like a few years ago, <laughs> right? And now we have like, you know, uh, customers actually using it and we yeah. even have a customer who is yeah. using different engines on different clouds. Their yeah. environment is in two clouds, yeah, yeah. using like BigQuery on one and Snowflake on another. So, so there's been some very cool yeah. uh, outcomes. Well, you're in a great area. Uh, put a plug in for the company. What are you looking for? Hiring, people, stats. Give a quick plug for the company that you're at. Got. Give a, you know. Yeah. So plug. I think uh, uh, we we like to think of ourselves as the the kid at the adult table. We are kind of like we've done some uh, like a lot of contributions yeah. on the technical open source side, yeah. but we are still like small and nimble and growing and yeah. building fast in a fast moving space. So yeah, we have engineering positions open. We're looking for like really uh, smart product managers. Uh, so yeah, if you're if you're interested, if, yeah. if lake houses are your thing, we have a lot of things to build and we'd yeah. love to have you. It's great to hear the Uber story. It's, you know, uh, in all the, this, in every wave, it's the pioneers who have to build everything from scratch. Facebook did it. We saw them with the hyperscale. They, and then they, they basically helped with Microsoft create open compute. Yeah. And you guys did it at Uber. Congratulations and thanks for coming on SuperCloud. All right, Appreciate this is it. really fun. Thank all you. All right, uh, we are here, SuperCloud 7. This is where the script is flipping and the data layer is important. You're starting to see a whole new set of a new modern data stack. A, and it's not looking like the other modern data stack, which we said is dead. It's changing significantly horizontally scalable data, enabling the next generation, which is generative AI applications. You got to do the work under the covers, infrastructure and data. You're hearing it all here at SuperCloud. I'm John Furrier here at Palo Alto, host of theCUBE. Thanks for watching.